this idea that, okay, the slaves really are benefiting from slavery, they could argue. They're benefiting from, but they have to know their place. And so sometimes you have to give them some tough love. A cop is giving someone the back of your head. A whip. Not like, oh, I'm not like a total punch, but whack. And a slave that's supposed to have been broken, therefore knows their place, being a, a, a subservient. In fact, I put down at least acting submissive, eyes down, yes sir, no sir, um, not talking back, doing exactly what they're saying. Another way to act submissive is slaves are supposed to act dumb, so they act dumb, stupid, because they're supposed to act that way. And that would be called a cuffy. And a cuffy was a horrific term, but it's kind of gone away. But a term that went away later would be a term called sample. And the sample was the same thing. A slave that accepted their place. And later on, there'd be like a children's little things about um, the term sample. But a big thing about a sample was a slave that knew their place, acted dumb, acted subservient, did what they were told, and therefore somebody who has accepted slavery, and that slavery is benefiting them. And so when I was a little kid, growing up in beautiful Eastern Montana, but there was a national chain of restaurants, and they were relatively cheap restaurants. So you know, we didn't have much money growing up. So we would go there whenever we traveled to the big city, Billings, and it was called Sambo's. And they had little references to this, and it was literally called this a term directly from slavery. And then there was a nursery rhyme about a little boy named Sambo. That was for little children to learn, and it came from slavery. And it was a little, just a little cheap little restaurant. They're gone now, but I guess there's still a restaurant in California called Little Sandals, still using this term. Now, we can think of worse terms that came out of slavery, which I'll get to in just a second, but these kind of racial slurs and stereotypes came out of, out of, out of slavery. And one more thing about it is, this would kind of be a form of passive resistance. I'm accepting, I'm doing what you want. So I don't get beaten, but find other ways to resist. And the important thing about this is after the Civil War, it would still be expected. And so Sample would be given this term of this kind of jolly doofus that was a, a slave. And their whole like shows called minstrel shows where white people in blackface would do these little song and dance things mocking slavery in the and they were really popular in urban centers of the north, but they would call elements samples and things like that. That's why blackface on a white person is so uh, insulting to anybody who's opposed to slavery. So here's a cartoon from 1890, and it's bringing this term up here. And it says, now, remember those pictures I showed you of the way they drew, they compared white or Caucasian to African and then a chimpanzee, you know, it's the face. Now it has that big stupid looking grin, so it has that sambo grin, and they're mocking this. And this is meant for people to laugh hilariously. And it says, here's him talking, say sambo, using lots of racial stereotypes here. Don't you think this piece of watermelon is, is rather large? And then here's him talking. Golly boss, that ain't half big enough. And just meant to mock and make fun. And this is an important element of slavery. And it also fits in quite well with racism. In fact, that's where we get this idea of racial slurs. It's a method of controlling somebody. It's certain, it could be color of skin, it also could be ethnic groups, it could be religious groups. I mean, think about any group. If they have a slur, a stereotype, they say, okay, we could just simply say all people like that are have this kind of lower standard. That's where they belong. And if you don't have one of these stereotypes, now you're above. I don't have much, but at least I don't have that whatever. Here's an attacking Irish. And it shows all kinds of slurs and racial stereotypes, even though it's ridiculous, the whole concept of race race anyways, but especially race for Irish and these are English settlers. It doesn't make any sense, except that's the way they looked at it. That was a caricature of Irish, drunken. And before the word terrorist, 
was around, implying that he's a bomb thrower because of attempts of Irish attacks on the English to try to get freedom in 1848. And these stereotypes, one group above the other, remember that whole thing about bacon for Bell. I don't have much, but at least I'm not bad. And that's where that comes from. So now we have to get to the worst word. Saying it, but I'm gonna show you, a, this is an ad from the 20th century, about 1912, for a little mechanical bank. And it's mocking them, so the image is more like a sambo, but I think you can see the word right there. Now, I know you weren't maybe expecting, that's why you laughed, but that term comes from the most uncivilized. And this was a term of the most derogatory term for a slave. You are at the bottom if you're that. You're uncivilized. But let's get to the main point. You're the most dangerous. The most dangerous. Remember the two things about slavery I told you about? They justify it by saying either we're civilizing and helping them. They're like little children. They'll starve on their own or they're savages. So there were these little banks, and I used to have one that was a rabbit. I don't know why, I was a rabbit. The little mechanical bank turned a crank, and if he puts a coin on the rabbit's paw, here it's the hand, and this shows a horrible caricature. It shows it like that sample caricature, but this was meant to be funny, which also showed you that uh, how casual this kind of racism would become. But you put that, the coin on the hand or paw, like my rabbit was, and the arm would kind of move and drop it in its mouth, and it would be a bank. And here it is for so it's kind of an old timey toy. And that's why that's, this term is so horrific. It comes from directly from slavery, and that literally means the most uncivilized, implying you have this term, you are at the absolute bottom. Absolute bottom. So there are reasons why this word is so offensive. And it comes from slavery. But here, it has this offensive term, and it takes it just horrifically mocking somebody else. And so with that, how would they fight back? Think about passive resistance. Acting the way you want, and then the slaves would resist. The most common, break stuff. Break stuff. Think about on the farm how many things there are to break. Oh, I dropped all the seeds in one hole, or I dropped them down a well. <laughs> I'm so dumb. Remember, they're supposed to act dumb. So do stupid things all the time. You're, you're supposed to put a horseshoe on each book? Oh, I didn't know. Nobody told me. You're not supposed to break the plow? Who told me when you make soup you're not supposed to urinate it? Nobody told me. You catch that little bit of resistance right there? Yeah, I wonder how common that was the slave for the master. I have a stomach ache. Hmm. Yes. They're always risky now. But remember, they're supposed to act dumb. So how would they act? I don't know. I'm dumb. They're risking it, but it's, they're fighting them. And think how many things are to break on a farm. And this is important because this is why slavery does not work in factories for the masters. Think how many moving parts are in a factory. Think how many things are to break. In a factory, you can just go on. Especially when you're um, the manufactured good, you might have no idea if it's broken inside. And that's why slavery does not work in factories very well. I mean, you can do it, but you have to have a lot more supervision. The quotas are going to be harsher, and they still might get away with it. And I'll give you a good example of this in World War II, Germany kidnapped. Millions of people from areas they occupy brought them back to Germany as slave laborers to work in factories, and they sabotaged things all the time. German equipment in World War II was notorious for how unreliable it was. German tanks would always squeak. In fact, Allies would talk about it. They could hear them squeaking the wheels because the laborers would not put ball bearings in. Supposed to. And you have the wheel put together. You don't know if the ball bearings are there or not. Then you have metal against metal, they squeak. Planes would crash. Unreliable. Very unreliable. And they were risking being tortured and executed. And they fought back. Slaves, this might shock you, don't actually like slavery. And so they fight back. 
despite all of the stuff they would say about civilizing them, they didn't like it. And so it was an act. This was actually kind of a big deal for the master. I mean, think about it if you have slaves keeping care of your children or cooking your food, as I kind of jokingly mentioned before. It's a fine line. And so sabotage. And so they will risk it to fight back. Another very common method would be spirituals. Okay, they were kind of a forced Christianity upon the slaves, partially to accept their lot. And so slave churches, slave meetings, in fact, that's one of the few places where slaves get together and talk, they would sing spirituals. And if you look at these, still away to Jesus, this is a print of one of the many spirituals. And they had elements that sounded like just a regular Christian song, a hymn. But if you think about it, no, wait, steal away, steal what? Steal me away from you. Steal away. It was a way to fight back. It was a way to fight back. You can hide your resistance in spirituals. Churches were a way to hide. In fact, slave funerals, the, this did not come out as well, but it was very common that slave funerals, and this would be all the way as long as there been slavery, would be almost celebrations. Yes, of course, people would be sad, but at the same time, they escaped. And this goes all the way back as far as long as we've been slaves. So I remember the first time I was in New Orleans, my wife and I were walking around the French Quarter. And um, a lot of it was tourists, because that's the way New Orleans is. And there was a funeral. And it was led by a band, and people were celebrating, and you know, of course, sad, but at the same time, celebrating their life, which is an important thing to do. But it really kind of took us by surprise. Just because it's a funeral. You can imagine other tourists like, it's a parade. No, it's a funeral. That's where the legacy comes from. And, of course, run away. run away. Deprive them of their labor. And there would be slave patrols who would hunt them down for the reward. And these a lot of times would be whites who did not have slaves, thinking if I capture a couple of slaves, I might be able to get a slave. Or to fight back against somebody who dares go against that. The system that gives me a little bit. And these are two posters from the end of the 18th century. This is from the 1850s. Look how much money now. That's in about $150,000. That gives you an idea how valuable the slaves have become. In fact, I should say runaway slaves are called, they're called, and this is actually in the Constitution, fugitives. It's fugitives are runaway slaves. And deprive them of their labor. It was very common for slaves to just run away and hide for a few days. Oh, they know they're going to get beat. But I fought back. I fought back. You're not going to get every ounce of blood out of me. Fought back. They know what's going to happen. And what was the irregular path of safe houses? and hiding places that we try to go north, either to New England or Canada. So we've all heard of the Underground Railroad, avoiding the slave patrols. And who else was like me when I remember being in elementary school, second or third grade, and I first heard about the Underground Railroad? Did anyone believe that it was an actual railroad? I, just, I was so like, oh, they're like tunnels. That's amazing. I was so disappointed when I found out it wasn't an actual like underground railroad. But still, this amazing group of incredibly brave people who would guide people north through a system of safe houses, underground hiding places, tunnels that would get like to the docks where they could hide on a ship or to a river boat where they could go north. Those were the most common way. It was a big arrow here, but that was really hard to go over land. And they still had to keep these safe houses here because this area was not friendly to fugitives. So it's Canada or here. That's why when I mentioned uh, Nauvoo before, uh, there were a couple of very prominent safe houses that are part of the National Park Service. So that's one of the many interesting things to go there when we go right to about here. But to get north, Henry uh, Brown, as he was known, actually, with help of others, shipped himself north by mail, so therefore on train in the 1850s in a box. 
So we hid in a box with a little bit of food. And I love this picture because Harry comes popping out in a suit. Like, I made it! After a week, I don't think he would have been like that, but it'd be one of the more famous examples. The brave people who led them north would be called conductors. Get it, Underground Railroad. And a lot of times women would do that because men would ignore. Two of the most famous Sojourner, uh, oh, wait, I'll come back to this one. Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. Sojourner Truth actually was part of one of the many kind of religious sects. I mentioned called the Cult of Mateus in New York during the Second Great Awakening. She would become a conductor, a tireless fighter for equal rights for women also. But Harriet Tubman's probably the most famous. And part of the way she could get away with what she did was not only her incredible intelligence and bravery, but she was unassuming, under five feet tall. And so here, she made 13 trips as a conductor after running away herself, going south 13 times, risking capture to bring back people. In fact, here is the ad for a reward for her. And it goes for very little bit. It was called Nitty. She gave herself the name Harry Tubman. 27, about five feet tall. She was under five feet tall. So that's the actual ad for her. And then during the Civil War, she would become a Union spy and actually lead Union forces on a raid in the South in South Carolina. Union forces were here on blockade duty. And so, pretty amazing person. I'll tell you one very quick story. So I was in Savannah. There's this, yeah, you know, I just, my, this is my story. It's a Southern First Baptist Church. And part of the whole thing of civilizing them is a very big contradiction. We're civilizing them, we're going to restrict them all, but they allowed slaves to build their own church, and they built a Baptist church in South Carolina. Had this massive tower, a hurricane came and took it all down, so that's what it looked like when I was there about eight years ago. And this was a, a very important spot on the Underground Railroad. And so this would be a slave church, a black preacher. Usually the black preacher would be a free black who was under great suspicion from Southern whites. So these seven white slaveholders. But you go in and go into where the church is and have all these holes in various designs. And in fact, they always would come in and search this. And they, um, the constables, think about a, a police, would go in and kind of laugh. Look at those funny little symbols. What are those? Air holes. It's a false floor. And there's a four foot little place within the hive. And then there was a little tunnel, three by three feet that would go the about quarter mile to the docks. Savannah River is a major, still is a major port, and they would be able to be smuggled on board a ship. So this would wait till a ship they know would take them and they would crawl. The tunnel you can just barely make out, but most of it's collapsed. Three by three, I can't even imagine going a couple hundred yards of that. Yeah, but hurry, Jeff. If you ever get a chance, go there. I was really great experience. And so the most horrific would be slave rebellion. But there were very few slave rebellions in the United States because of the percentage of slaves. And that, remember, every place had a militia, but with the greater percentage of non-slaves, the bigger the militia. So there were slave rebellions all throughout the Americas. And some were huge. Massive slave rebellions, most famously, remember Haiti, there was a slave rebellion and they got their independence. But there would actually be a slave rebellion in Brazil for a while there. They had their own kind of independent little slave kingdom in the jungles right here and elements of it still exist. Same thing happened in what is now Belize. But very few in the United States because of the percentages. But remember, the higher the percentage, the greater chance of slave rebellion. I'm not going to cover all the slave rebellions, obviously, but there's a couple I do want to mention. New Orleans in 1811 was a large slave rebellion, starting on a plantation, field hands, and these field hands were on plantations that were owned actually by Spanish planters or now American planters because they're part of the United States. But they started northwest of New Orleans, and they marched down the river, plantation to plantation, freeing slaves and 
knowing that their punishment, what's going to happen to them, basically butchering any wives they found so they could escape. And their plan was to march to New Orleans where they thought they would get their freedom because there had been this rumor going on along the plantations that I know this is seven years after or eight years after the Louisiana Purchase, but they heard they're part of this country called the United States that believed in liberty. And so when they marched, they carried an American flag because that's what they thought. But the militia would be called out and a few regular soldiers and just spotted. Capturing most, slaughtered and then capturing most of them, they beheaded most of them. And then along this path on pikes, they put the heads. To tell any other slaves, this is what's going to happen. So this was the state government of Louisiana with help of the United States government. This caused terror, but they also said, well, it's New Orleans. They were part of the United States for very long. If you go there, there's a monument there and it goes for about 100 yards, but they recreate this. And it's one of the most powerful ones I've ever been to. Monuments. It goes about 200 yards. But this is a memorial. And I like the fact that they don't pull any punches. I, I bet there's <laughs> a lot of people who want to get rid of that. Act like it didn't happen. And so, the other one I have to mention here is Denmark Bessie. He was a free, they call the freedman, a former slave. He was a preacher in a Baptist church. All, most of his parish was, were uh, former slaves. And he was accused of trying to start a slave rebellion. I forgot to write this down for Charleston, South Carolina. And we don't know if he actually was doing it or not. He was arrested, would be executed. And this would lead to a big crackdown on slaves, but especially freed slaves, trying to kick them out, make them leave in Charleston. And this fit in the fear that, oh, there are people sowing discontent amongst the slaves. And then probably the most famous and most important movie, Nat Turner. 1831, he was educated. He too was a preacher, he was a slave. He organized this in the swampy area outside of this plantation. This is an area of high concentration of plantations in East or Western Virginia. They would eventually revolt. 55 whites would be killed as they would march from plantation to plantation using whatever farm implements they could grab. But the militia would soon be called out. And you can see the numbers, over 120 of the people uh, fighting for freedom would be killed. 56 would later be executed, including Nat Turner. And this is going to just terrify, just terrify the South. I can't even begin to tell you how much of a big deal Nat Turner was. Because Denmark Vesey was just a threat. New Orleans, they could say, well, that was because they had been part of the US. Here is in Virginia. In fact, Virginia was talking post Navy emancipation. Remember that? Emancipate them after they're born. Kentucky was too. And that stopped that. And this spread fear. 1831 is a key year. But let's get back to all three of those New Orleans, Bessie, and Nat Turner. Who told on them? Who spread the word of the rebellion? household slaves in each instance. In fact, it was the governor's household slaves who supposedly told on Bess in South Carolina. They told. And that shows you how insidious slavery would be. And so out of this will come the strongest slave codes that virtually every slave state, including Delaware, would adopt the Nat Turner laws. And they would be everything from every, every person with darker colored skin in the South had to wear a slave tag. Some kind of tag to show who they are or that they're free and had to wear it all the time. Punishable by imprisonment and hard labor. In fact, if a free person of darker, uh, darker colored skin, I mean, just darker colored skin, didn't have that, they could be sold in the slave. I remember being told that slaves would not be allowed to read or write. That wasn't necessarily the law until Nat Turner, because Nat Turner could read. 
limiting the assembly outside of church, the militia would be strengthened. They began to censor the mail. And that is where you get, I mentioned this before, the gag rule in Congress saying no debate about slavery. All of these came out of that term. And why the mail? Because they said abolitionist material was riling up the slaves. Nat Turner laws were a big deal. These were all uh, from a slave, a slave trade museum, really good museum in South Carolina. But all of these things to restrict slaves. So these are the strictest of the slave codes, the Nat Turner law. And of course, right after the Civil War, the South would try to get, they called them black codes. Same basic law, just now they're not with the word slavery. And the reason why 1831 is such a big deal is because of abolition. Abolitionism would really get its start in 1820s, but 1831 with William Lord, Lloyd Garrison would publish a newspaper. This was his newspaper called The Liberator. And you notice the year. It came out just a few months before Nat Turner's Rebellion. So Southerners claimed the slaves were perfectly happy until they started getting this liberator, and that's why we have to censor the mail so they don't get the liberator anymore. Garrison was an uncompromising anti-slavery fight, uh, fighter against slavery. And a lot of people said, you're going too far. You're going to anger the North. And his response was, literally, are you going to have a debate with a rapist? And so he would become, let's say, let's put it this way, he could not leave Massachusetts, or he would have been lynched. Frederick Douglass was probably the most famous one, famous abolitionist. He was a former slave. And as he said, I stole myself. He was household slave. And there was beatings all the time. But he felt that he was beaten for no reason. It was the last straw. He lived in Maryland, so he got no. He wrote his autobiography, then bought himself out of slavery. And then would start a newspaper called the North Star. And of course, using the racism of the time, it was assumed that well, he could not have been intelligent enough to write this. He's a brilliant man. He was, did learn how to read and write as a slave because he kept the books, the home. But he would write the North Star. Do you think the North Star followed the star? Follow the star, and you're going on. I to get my directions right. If it gets higher in the sky, you know you're making it. And the thing about him, yes, he wanted to win slavery, but that's not enough. It can't just be freedom. It has to be freedom and equality. That's why he fought so hard for black soldiers in the Civil War who would be decisive for the victory of the United States. How can you deny somebody equal rights if they're willing to die for their country? How could you deny them? Of course, a lot would, but how could you deny that? And he understood something else. Even though the term was not around yet, racism would not come around to the next, very beginning of the next century, he knew that it's class. It's class, it's about status. And if you could get to just enough people that you will lose your status if you get rid of slavery, or lose your status if you have equality, they will fight to keep their status. It's about this. That makes it a hard fight to get rid of racism. It's not just simply, I don't like somebody because they look different. It's, I will lose what I have. And if I don't have much, so you have to get over that, find a way to alleviate that issue. But here's the neat thing. A lot of people are in the anti-slavery. Oh, sure. Abolitionists believe slavery is immoral, immoral, but a lot did not believe in equality. Harrison did. Douglas did. Douglas was that. What is the Women's Rights Convention? Remember that convention? Those that fold again? Seneca Falls. He was there. But a lot of abolitionists wanted to get rid of the evils of slavery, but they still wanted a white republic. And so, yeah, we want to get rid of slavery, but we don't want equality, or for that matter, we, want, we don't want former slaves living here. 
We want a white republic and no slave power. Remember the, the three-fifths compromise. That is why you're going to get a lot of abolitionists will support the American Colonization Society. And that idea would be freeing slaves through private contributions, but more and more free soil or anti-soil politicians agree they would be freed and then sent back to Africa. And the reason I use quotes, because virtually all of them, especially by the 1840, all of slaves were born in the United States. Sent them back to where? And so they actually carved out an area of Africa. The capital of it is Monrovia, because James Monroe was present when this happened. This was a private entity. Here's a militia of former slaves in Monrovia. And what place did they create? Liberia. Going to Liberia. With the idea being, we'll get you out of here. Liberia originally or not here, but eventually out of part of it's going to be called why Maryland? I don't know, but Maryland. That's not the African coast, but right there, and it's still an independent country, even though you would have the tiered system of the former slaves, but that should be above the Africans who live there. And this would survive, even though because of that differences between the former slave descendants of former slaves and the Africans there. It's gone through horrific years of civil war. You, it's shocking how many politicians believed in this well into the civil war. With the idea that slaves will be freed and then send over four million human beings across the ocean and just drop off in Africa and say goodbye. One of those people who thought that might be a good thing to do was his name was Abraham Lincoln. 1863, he was still talking about that. So Lincoln would go through some pretty dramatic shifts. Because by the end of the year, he's talking equality. People can grow. I, I'm using the term grow as in I, if you're for equality. And so, okay, that one makes me laugh. I'm not leaving, are you? This can only mean one thing. Let's write a thesis! Woo I know I can feel your joy. Good practice. Let's write a thesis. And your margin, wherever it might be, in your notes. <clears throat> now remember that why. <laughs> what is the thing about slavery they would use to tie all the other things together? I've given you lots of ways they try to justify it. Pizza! According to the transcript, I said, that's right, I pizza this. <laughs> Everyone likes pizza. Does anyone here not like pizza? You know what? <laughs> Did you like it? I'm going to tie together three things, three paragraphs.
Okay, does everyone have an X? Or X is easy. <laughs> X is the easy part. Everyone have a Y, something to tie it together. And the variety of questions, does anyone have an A, B, and C? That's actually the easiest part, I think. And remember, those will be your, your topic sentence for each paragraph. And when you do DBQ, you do the same exact thesis. Okay, go ahead and look at it. Wait a minute, before you go, who has an example of a Y? What's your example? Yeah, so better put the celebs. Anybody, I could have put down like economic success. Or on your way out, you want to see mine real quick? Mine's racism. That ties everything together. Did anyone use racism? Anyone use racism in your A, B, and C? Anyone use positive good theories? Anybody use uh, civilizing? All right, good job. I don't know. One more minute. I'm in New York City. I, I love New York City. I've been there before. You're going to go to a show? Awesome, that'll be fun. Let's see them, see them all. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, I expect. Oh, very good, thank you. And tomorrow, can you give me those documents? Just give them to me tomorrow. Yeah. And third story, it's good. Uh, two days. And then we talked about BBQs a um, little bit on little bit on yeah. Tuesday. So that would have been suspicious. Sample. Yes. How do you write a DBQ? So just read it on your own. Wednesday, we'll talk about class. Sound good? No, different teachers. I know. Oh, yeah, she has one. Sorry. Yeah, credit. Go ahead and take it out. Well, you didn't get the extra credit. No, I'm trying to. 